Church, we are in a new season as the church goes. We are in a season of Lent, which began on Ash Wednesday. This season of study and reflection is going to take us all the way to Easter. And we have called it Ashes to Ashes. If you paid attention from last Sunday's sermon, we are to acknowledge that we are in a race. Everybody is part of this race. The one thing that makes us different is why we're racing. Some people, I'm sure you know people who race just to acquire things, belongings, money. Others race for fame. Question is, why do you race? We have called this race ashes to ashes. From ashes we come to ashes we shall return, the beginning and the end. And we are to do it while keeping our eyes on Jesus. This thing is, that, is what makes us different. If we are able to race our race, to live our life while keeping our eyes on Jesus, We will be that better off. We're going to continue this study of this race, Ashes to Ashes. And today we're approaching the book of Daniel, chapter 9. However, there are a few things that I want you to know before we dive in into Daniel, chapter 9. You have to know that Daniel's name means God is my judge. Daniel knows fully well that there is a difference between punishment, discipline, and consequences. God can do all of them. God can punish you. However, God chooses to discipline you. If you want to know more about that, then you will have to refer to the sermon from Ash Wednesday, where we were heavily talking about what is the difference between discipline, and punishment, and why sometimes as fathers or mothers or grandparents, we need to discipline our children, not punish them. However, we never touch much of consequences, and that's what we're going to have to talk today. Daniel was a young person when he was kidnapped and taken to Babylon by the king. He was a noble Jewish youth. He of all things, was able to serve God, but also serve his master, the king at that time. So one of the things that we have to remember is that despite the difficulties of his life, Daniel never take the easy way out, never took the easy way out, but he remained truth to God, especially in the midst of difficult circumstances. If you read the book of Daniel, you will see how Daniel challenges himself to always be faithful. And that makes him a hero for us as Christians. However, for Judaism, Daniel is not a prophet. However, it is considered a great example of how to follow what God tells us to do despite difficult times. That's all. As an introduction, let us dive into chapter 9, verse 13 to 19 from the book of Daniel. So I turned to the Lord God and pleaded with him in prayer and fasting. I also wore rough burlap and sprinkled myself with ashes. I prayed to the Lord my God and confessed. O Lord, you are a great and awesome God. You always Fulfill your covenant and keep your promises of unfailing love to those who love you and obey your commands. But we have sinned and done wrong. We have rebelled against you and scorned your commands and regulations. We have refused to listen to your servants, the prophets, who spoke on your authority to our kings and princes and ancestors and to all the people of the land. Lord, you are in the right But as you see, our faces are covered with shame. This is true of all of us, including the people of Judah and Jerusalem and all Israel, scattered near and far. 
Whatever you have driven us because of our disloyalty to you, O Lord, we and our kings and princes and ancestors are covered with shame because we have sinned against you. But the Lord our God is merciful and forgiven, even though we have rebelled against him. We have not obeyed the Lord our God, for we have not followed the instructions he gave us through his servants, the prophets. All Israel has disobeyed your instructions and turned away, refusing to listen to your voice. So now the solemn curses and judgments written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, have been poured down on us because of our sin. You have kept your word and done to us and our rulers exactly as you warn. Never has there been such a disaster as happened in Jerusalem. Every curse written against us in the law of Moses have, has come true. Yet we have refused to seek mercy from the Lord our God by turning from our sins and recognizing his truth. Therefore, the Lord has brought upon us the disaster he prepared. The Lord our God has was right to do all these things, for we did not obey him. O Lord our God, you brought lasting honor to your name by rescuing your people from Egypt in a great display of power. But we have sinned and are full of wickedness. In your view and all your faithful mercies, Lord, Please turn your furious anger away from your city, Jerusalem, your holy mountain. All the neighboring nations mock Jerusalem and your people because of our sins and the sins of our ancestors. O oh, our God, hear your servant's prayer. Listen as I plead for your own sake, Lord. Smile again on your desolate, desolate sanctuary. Oh, my God, lean down and listen to me. Open your eyes and see our despair. See how your city, the city that bears your name, lies in ruins. We make this plea, not because we deserve help, but because of your mercy. Oh, Lord, hear. Oh, Lord, forgive. Oh, Lord, listen and act. For your own sake, do not delay. Oh, my God. For your people and your city bear your name. This is the word inspired by God for us, the children of God. Thanks be to God. The lesson that we are considering today is called consequences and faithfulness. Why consequences and faithfulness? Well, the consequences of sin is death. That is what we know from the scriptures. Sin. Not simply the little sin that we do. You know, the lies, the stealing. No, the big S sin. Our nature has consequences. The sin that we bear brings great consequences for us and our children and consequent generations. Why faithfulness? Because God is love. It is not simply that God loves us. No. God is love. And so, he cannot help but love us. God is faithful. It's not simply faithful to us, but in essence, God is love and faithful. So much that even the Apostle Paul in the book of Romans chapter 8 affirms that he is convinced and we are to be convinced also that nothing can separate us from the love of God. You can trust, my beloved church, you can trust that God will never, ever, ever, ever abandon you. Question is, what are you going to do with this information? Well, there's two ways to look at it from my point of view. First one is, if you know God will always love you, then you can do whatever you want. 
Because God would always love you. So you can be as as evil as you want because God will love you no matter what. However, there is another way to look at it. The way that I will recommend you is to say, despite my brokenness, despite my sinful nature, despite me making wrong, I know God loves me. So I am going to confess my sin with the sure knowledge that God is faithful to forgive and will accompany me in my journey of reconciliation with God and the kingdom of God. Meaning that your love should, the, God's love should not give you the confidence to do whatever you want, but the confidence for you to approach God despite your unfaithfulness. Why confess our sins? Because confession is good for the soul. Saturday, you saw in the video, the announcement video, Saturday was a great day. We were cleaning the youth room, trying to foment a good space for building the faith of youth, for them to be able to come and enjoy a place that was prepared for them. However, it was a lot of fun for me because I get to destroy a lot of things. We have an old fridge. It was full of mold and rust. So we were able to take him down, and when we got to the dumpster, we needed to remove the doors. And they're like, oh, we forgot the door, the, the tools. And it's like, you don't need tools. Watch this. I grabbed one of the doors, and I just pulled it really hard, and it came off. It was like, oh, this is fun. And I grabbed the other one, and I pulled it again, and it turned apart. Then I got to the second floor, and I saw this desk that was broken that we were going to throw away. We don't need to take it down the stairs. I just grab the whole thing and lift it off my shoulder and toss it. It flipped. It was really cool. You should have seen it. It was a beautiful thing. But when it landed, everything went away. And you know what happened? I broke one of the windows in the office. <laughs> oh, it feels good to tell you that. Confession. Obviously, you and I have a relationship, and I know that you love me, even if I broke a window of the office. And I know that you know that I will do what is necessary for me to fix that window. And not only that, I know that you know that I know that you will help me fix that window. It happened right away. A couple of members of the church laugh and then just start scraping the window. We put plexiglass, we put bowls, and now we are measuring the glass to fix it the right way. Brothers and sisters, that's no different than whatever sin you have. If there is love between you and the people of God, because of God, you can admit your sin. And you will rest. Many of us go through life carrying these lies that we tell ourselves. We don't confess the wrong that we do, so it's festering in our hearts and holding us back. Confession was not given to us to make us feel guilty. No, confession was given to us as a gift for us to come clean. And the good news is that we can talk to God directly and to say, my Lord, my Lord, my God, forgive me for I have sinned against you and against me and my brothers and sisters. And you can do that also with your brothers and sisters. That confession will set you free from the trick of Satan. Dishonesty, keeping it to yourself, will fester and will make you live in a dark place. Not confessing will produce spiritually and physical misery. God wants us to spare that. So God says, I love you. Be not afraid. I will listen if you come clean to me. It is not that I don't know. It is that I want you to tell me because you want to be in relationship with me. Understand that as Christians, the road to recovery is through repentance. 
which involves full acknowledgement of the things that you have broken, the glass, and to make reparations as long and as fast as you can. Believe me, the Bible doesn't teach us forgive and forget. The Bible holds us accountable. It's a testimony of how God has hold his people accountable throughout generations. Without confession, there is no forgiveness. One of the biggest subjects that the world has been talking about, our nation has been talking about, is racism. Racism is an evil, something that we must confess. Whether we did it Directly or indirectly, that is something that we have to confess because it's something that continues to come up and bubble up. But Mario, I'm not racist. I know, I know. But there is a role that each of us play and we have to confess. And not simply not be racist, but be anti-racist. That means that you have to take the steps, the necessary steps for you to go against it. We have to take the time to examine our role, whether it was passive or aggressive. We have to take and check our blind spots. Take confession as a medicine. Real confession has the power to redeem you. But Mario, I don't know where to begin. Well, thank you for saying that because the worship and music team consider Daniel 9 as a structure for you to follow. Daniel suggests that only after the Lord is praised and our sin is confessed, we are qualified to make a request to God. In the Bible, my beloved church, in the Bible, there are structures, there are things to help us to pray. One of them is the Lord's Prayer. If you follow that, you will do a righteous pray. But Daniel 9, verses 3 to 19, also has a structure that we can follow. It has a brief introduction. An adoration to the Lord. It has confession and personal, but also national sin. Daniel teaches us in these verses that it's not enough for us to confess the sin that we have done, but confess the sin of our nation that has happened. And only then there is the petition from the prophet. If you would like to know this structure, you can pick up one of the sheets that has the announcements. And on the other side, you will see this breakdown of verses. And you will find it helpful as you hopefully practice this. And I know confessing is very uncomfortable. Especially, especially if nobody knows you did wrong. Confessing your sin when it's hidden from everyone, when you are absolutely positive that nobody knows that you did wrong, it's really difficult to confess. And that is exactly what we're called to do because God sees it all. In this season of Lent, we have to recognize our limits and we have to recognize our sinful nature and we have to consider how we are journeying from one place to the other, from ashes to ashes, while we keep our eyes on Jesus. Please know that God has the experience, the knowledge, and the power to turn whatever is it that you think you did wrong into a blessing. If not, tell me about that joke that I blew at the beginning of the worship. God has the ability to say, yeah, You blew it. Even though you practice the joke more than you practice the sermon, I'm still going to make it work. Why? Because today is about admitting our mistakes, admitting when we messed up, and still give the glory to God. Consider the consequences of our sin. Not because of the guilt that I may or may not be giving you today. But I, as a friend, and as your pastor, I am recommending that if you are carrying that weight around you, you are damaging yourself and your family. 
recognize not only your sin, but the sin of your family, the sin of your community, the sin of this world. And make it public, make it known that you are to repent, you are to repent and want to make amends. And do it while keeping your eyes on Jesus. Brothers and sisters, it's going to be a great Lent journey for us to challenge ourselves and to see the power of God despite our mistakes. Because if there is something I have learned in this life is that God has factored in our faults. Amen.